I hope you were able to drive the Beeline Highway prior to 2020. If you've driven a Beeline Highway, it's just beautiful. Uh, it's a wonderful drive. It's the trip from Mesa to Payson, and it takes you through dense saguaro forest, if you can call a bunch of cacti a forest. You go past Four Peaks, uh, Palo Verde, there are flowers out. Uh, sometimes there's fresh snow. I, I love to get up on Beeline Highway after the snow has fallen on the saguaros and Four Peaks is in the background. It's some of the best of our wet desert right up that highway. Piled up boulders, uh, and I've heard in those, you know, the section of piled up boulders on the right side on the hill before you uh, get up to Ord Mountain that there are Gila monsters in there. I want to get out and rock, walk through those boulders and find a Gila monster someday. You get these grand vistas where you come over a hill and uh, entire valleys just lay out in front of you and they're covered with green things. You see the Mazatzal Mountains up on the left. They get to nearly 8,000 feet and they're pine tree covered. You go past Sycamore Creek and the scrub forest and the jagged peaks. And then you round the corner around Mount Ord, especially the north side. It's got all those tree-covered rocks, those nooks and crannies, and the rock spires that jut out between tall pines. And then beyond that, of course, the Muggy on Rim, you've got the pine forest and trout streams. But since January of 2020, no more green. Have you driven it since then? Just black scars on rolling hills of dirt, charred saguaro, no more Palo Verde. The scrub forest is gone. You go past Mount Ord, and all of those pine trees on the backside, the north side of Mount Ord, they're just gone. And so all those rocks are lonely. The valley that Sycamore Creek runs through is now bleak, kind of like a Martian landscape struggling to re-sprout. Have you seen it? What happened? One of the largest brush fires in Arizona history covered 193,000 acres, and it started when one car pulled over into the tall grass on the side of the road. It caused a number of neighborhoods on the west side of uh, Roosevelt Lake to be evacuated, brought damage to homes, but just left that beautiful drive between Mesa and Payson a scarred hulk. What I want to talk about this morning for equipping hour is the tongue that sets great forests on fire. Do you know it? Do you know the ability of human speech and human communication to bring devastation, sometimes irreparable harm uh, to lives, to relationships? And I'm going to be really clear up front, this morning's discussion of speech will be a specific application to online speech, to online speech. We're going to be talking about particularly broadcast speech, you know, the kind of speech that you say and then it's just open and out there for everybody to see, to read, to hear. You know, we're talking about blogging and social media posting and radio broadcasts, and writing books, and recording albums. All of those things where information and speech goes out from us broadly. You know, the very idea of the word broadcast came from sowing seed. A farmer would reach into his bag with seed, and he'd cast it broadly. That's, what bro that's where broadcasting comes from. We use it, of course, for radio, television, other forms of mass media communication, where you just throw things out there. Wherever the seed goes, that's where it lands and something grows, hopefully. But when we broadcast information, we are just sending our words out into the stratosphere, out into the internet, and hoping, perhaps, that good comes for them, or not caring at all what becomes of our words. We want to deal with God honoring communication. Here's what James says in James chapter 3. By the way, uh, the title for this morning is Tongues and Tweets of Fire. This is going to be a very simple exercise this morning. We're going to be looking at biblical passages on communication, on speech. And then we're going to uh, pull out some principles for online speech. I've got some note sheets here. You can either go to the website and pull up the, the notes. They have all the scriptures written out there. It's about six pages. 
Um, a couple of the men here have handwritten sheets. If you want a handwritten sheet so you can just follow along and not have to turn in your Bible, um, we've, we've got a handful of those. So uh, maybe share in pairs or, or whatever if you want one of those. So I don't know if there are any behind you, Dave. Did you already pass them out? Oh, that was fast. That was an application of broadcasting, indiscriminate distribution of information. All right, here's James chapter 3. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. And you know here that the tongue is a metaphor for speech. It's metonymy. It's using a part of the body to describe something bigger than itself. We're not really talking about the anatomical feature of a tongue. We're, we're talking about what comes out of the mouth. And as Jesus said, what is in the heart comes out through the mouth. We're talking about speech and communication. We could as easily say, no one can tame the keyboard. Because when we deal with biblical principles for speech and communication, we must apply it to written form as well as to spoken words. All communication should be governed by biblical principles of speech. But if you think about indiscriminate public communications, those bring with them even more risks than one-on-one conversations. When we blog, when we post on social media, when we host podcasts, these are communications designed for public consumption. Writing books, publishing music, making movies, all of those things, they affect more people simply because they are indiscriminate And the recipients go far beyond the intended audience. Not to mention that whatever we say and do online stays online. And even the the recognition that a personal conversation can can create irreparable damage. Indiscriminate publication of communication can have far more devastating irreparable damage simply because of its reach. I would ask you this, can an American citizen claim freedom of speech? Yes. Can a citizen of heaven claim freedom of speech? Can you just say whatever you want to say, (laughs) citizen of heaven? No. No, of course not. You and I are governed by far more than the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. We are governed by what pleases the Lord. Our tongues, our keyboards, our conversations, even our motives for having conversations are to be governed by biblical principles. So that's where we're going this morning. First, we're going to listen to some texts on communication. And the references will be on the screen. Do not try to write all those down. They're spelled out for you on the note sheets or on the web outline. But let's just listen to God's Word. And this is just in canonical order. We're just kind of from the left side of our Bible to the right side of our Bible. These are not arranged thematically. Uh, We're just going to get a flow and trajectory of some of the things God has said about speech. Leviticus 19.16, you shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you are not to act against the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. Psalm 15.3, describing the godly man, he does not slander with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Psalm 101.5, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. Proverbs 4.24, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, there are six things which Yahweh hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. 
Proverbs 8.13, the fear of Yahweh is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. Proverbs 10.8, the wise of heart will receive commands, but, but, but a babbling fool will be ruined. How much of internet trafficked communication is the babbling of fools? Proverbs 10.19, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his keyboard is wise. That was a paraphrase. Keyboard's not in the Hebrew text. Proverbs 10, 20 and 21, the tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of understanding. That's a great proverb because it speaks not negatively. It doesn't tell us stop talking. It actually gives a positive endorsement of good speech, good communication. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs 12, 17, he who speaks truth tells what is right. Proverbs 12, 18, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I know you have all experienced rash communication. Pick up the phone, you go to write a text, you hit send, and you haven't checked whether Siri has corrected your spelling correctly. And you end up saying things you wish you had not said. Thrusts of a sword. Proverbs 12, 19. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. That to me is such a great comfort. The truth stands. All the world of lies that happen in human communication, they come and they go. We're so quick to follow after one, then the other, then the next, then the next, only to find out five minutes later, oh, it wasn't true, but I got all worked up. But the truth stands. Proverbs 12, lying lips are an abomination to Yahweh, but those who deal faithfully are his delight. 12, a prudent man conceals knowledge, the heart of fools proclaims folly. 13, the one who guards his keyboard preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. 14.23, in all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Have you noticed that there are many talkers on the internet and, and not doers? Sometimes do you wish the people that are doing all the talking would just get to doing? Like, do you really have time to be saying all these things? Don't you have a job? <laughs> Couldn't you be doing something productive? And maybe your job is to say all those things on the internet, I don't know. A gentle answer turns away wrath, 15.1, but a harsh word stirs up anger. 15.2, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. 15.23, a man has joy in an apt answer, and how delightful is a timely word. 15.28, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. 1628, a perverse man spreads strife and a slanderer separates intimate friends. 174, an evildoer listens to wicked lips. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. Do you see there the issue isn't even just communication, but what we're giving ear to? 16, or 17, Nine, he who conceals a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. 17.14, the beginning of strife is like letting out water, so abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. 17.27, he who restrains his words has knowledge, he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's considered prudent. 18.2, a fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. 18.6, a fool's lips bring strife and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are the snare of his soul. 18.8, the words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels and they go down in the innermost parts of the body. There is an innate attraction to hearing the latest dirt on other people. 
18.13, he who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. 19.1, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than he who is perverse in speech and is a fool. 20, verse 3, keeping away from strife is an honor for a man, but any fool will quarrel. 2019, he who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. 2025, it is a trap for a man to say rashly, it's holy, and after the vows to make inquiry. You understand the principle there. To say, oh, no, no, this is fine for me to do. It's okay, it's okay. And not really to think thoroughly about something. Proverbs 21, 23, who, who guard, he who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. 23, 15, and 16, my son, if your heart is wise, my own heart also will be glad, and my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. 25, 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstance. Like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. 25.15, by forbearance a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue breaks the bone. 26.20, for lack of wood the fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, contention quiets down. Like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Have you noticed how polarized our culture has become? Only inflamed by the whispering that goes on and on and on. Proverbs 27, let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. 29, 20, do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. 30, 10, do not slander a slave to his master or he will curse you and you will be found guilty. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. Every careless word that people type and post and tweet. Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Colossians 3.8, now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Colossians 4.6, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. 1 Timothy 3.11, women must be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. 1 Timothy 4.12, Timothy, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but in your speech, show yourself an example of those who believe. 1 Timothy 5.13, at the same time, they learn to be idle. They go around from house to house, not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. James 1.19, this you know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. James 1.26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. And then the classic passage, James chapter 3. Let not many of you become teachers, my brothers, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put bits into the horses' mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. And look at the ships also, though they are so great and they are driven by strong winds, they are directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires." so also the tongue is a small part of the body. And yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, 
the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Now you might be tempted to think after listening to God's indictment of the human tongue, I will never say another word. It's a good start, but that's not the whole answer. Not all of these texts are negative. Many of them enjoin us to speak good things, to speak truth, to speak with integrity, to speak words that build up and benefit others. There are words chosen for an appropriate time. There is reproof. There is correction. There is teaching one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There is much communication that we must do. Can Christians participate in social media? Can Christians write blogs, host podcasts, and engage in other forms of broadcast media? And the answer to that would be yes, with fear, with fear. First of all, fear of the Lord. The abject terror that comes with God himself, our maker, holding us accountable for every careless word and a love for him that draws us close to him and plants in us a desire to be pleasing to him. That is the starting point of everything. That is the beginning point of wisdom. It is the beginning point of speech. And we must not only have a fear of the Lord, we must actually fear harming others bringing harm to other people. That ought to be something we're afraid of. We ought to be afraid of forest fires, conflagrations that mar the landscape and destroy lives. Listen, there are many Christians who should be broadcasting their thoughts. We love for them to broadcast their thoughts. If you've ever read a good book, you've experienced discipleship. If you've read a good Christian book, you you get the best of the best of what someone who walked with Christ well has written down for our benefit. There are people who should write. There are people who should teach, people who should blog, people who should host podcasts. But they still must do so in fear. The real question for each one of us is, should I broadcast my thoughts? Should I be entertained by the amalgam of broadcast thoughts that is social media? Am I prepared for that? Am I in a place of spiritual maturity where my own speech is being governed by biblical principles for communication and where my excursions into social media are regulated by a desire to please the Lord and to love others? Listen, you can take these verses that we've just walked through together and paste them, tape them over your computer screen or over your phone and read them. And let them be the filter that you throw your heart into your social media experience with. Run your heart through the grid of God's expectations of what to say, how to say it, why to say it, when to say it, and on the flip side of that, what to listen to, what to read, what to put into my mind and in my heart. When is the last time you deleted an email or a blog post comment before you posted it? (laughs) Oh, man, that's sin. (laughs) Backspace, backspace, backspace. Do you do that? Have you disciplined yourself to tame the keyboard? When is the last time you recognized that your heart was not in a good place, that your mind was not captivated by truth, and you decided to not post something online? I've got to get my heart in line before I set some forests on fire. Knowing yourself is really important. 
knowing that a broadcast communication cannot be retrieved. You can't get it back once it's out and that it will affect others. Do you pray as you engage in social media? Let's take a look at some principles that must apply, and these principles must apply not only to the content of social media excursions, but also the demeanor, our disposition, our attitude, and they must apply to our motives. When we think about principles applying to content, we we mean that what we write has to be truth. The content has to be God-honoring. When we talk about our demeanor, that means the way we comport ourselves, the way we carry ourselves in communication, not quarrelsome, not angry, I'm not venting. Listen, you can be truthful, but venting anger, that's not pleasing to the Lord. You can have the truth on your side, but be contentious, that's not pleasing to the Lord. You can be a contrarian. You just love to get in there and and mix it up and disagree with people because it's fun. (laughs) And even where the blind squirrel finds a nut in the forest or the stopped clock is right twice a day, even when you stumble onto truth, if the way you carry truth is sinful, you will make good truth look bad. And so our demeanor is important to the Lord. And He sees it at the heart level. And then finally, our motives must be in keeping with the fear of the Lord and a desire to please God. Why do I want to like that comment? Why do I want to retweet this tweet? Why do I want to say what I'm about to say? Those motives are critical, absolutely critical. And probably the most important thing, the the great big chunk of ice that's mostly underwater that is your heart, that tells you why to post and when to post and when to retweet and all of that stuff is unseen to the world, but wide open book in heaven. And those are the things we have to examine. The content must be in line with God's ways, our Demeanor must be in line with God's ways, and our motives must be in line with God's ways. Let's talk about some of these principles. And really here, I'm just kind of summarizing a lot of what we just went through in the texts. The first one is this, please the Lord. Please the Lord. That is our our motive, our first driving ambition whenever we communicate. And again, we're thinking specifically in broadcast communications, this indiscriminate desire to just say what's on my mind and get it out there for everybody to see. It must be regulated by a desire to please the Lord. That begins with knowing what pleases the Lord. That begins by knowing it. That means read your Bible. Hear God's voice on a regular basis. Have God's word coursing through your veins so that you know what kinds of things are pleasing to him and what kinds of things aren't. It's really imperative that we know what is pleasing to him. And then we desire to do what is pleasing to him. And so we must pray. And when you find yourself not doing what is pleasing to the Lord, you confess it to the Lord and you repent and you pray again. We must ask God, would you let this tweet honor you? This group text, this Instagram post, this Facebook post, this like, this endorsement, this retweet, all of it. God, would this be pleasing to you? The second principle is this. Beginning with the desire to please the Lord, we we also have to fear teaching. Fear teaching. And, And what I mean specifically is teaching things of a theological nature, a spiritual nature, worldview issues, things that comport with biblical reality, right? If your regular course of habit is to tweet geometrical equations for fun, I don't think we're going to have a problem. 
But are these, these times when we decide to be teachers of spiritual things, things that matter for eternity, things that affect people's lives in real life and at the heart level on spiritual things where truth is at stake. And we find ourselves wanting to give a voice, have an audience for our thoughts, especially those thoughts that just come to our mind right there and they're not really well thought through. It's impulsive, it's reflexive, and I just got to say it, where's the internet? Send, boom, it's out there. What does James 3.1 say? Let not many of you become teachers, my brothers. And we all just became teachers in the information age. And not the one another kind of teaching in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and normal body life, but broadcast teachers to the world out there. And, and we contribute to this collective ignorance, which is a lot of information and a dearth of wisdom. And the tragedy for us is if I feel like something, the world must know it. If a thought comes into my head, my followers must hear it. That has almost become like breathing in the information age. And it's almost reflexive and habitual and not thought through, not intentional in a really well-planned way, just reflexive. These theological things, when Christians particularly just communicate whatever is off the top of their head, is problematic, and it's problematic <clears throat> particularly in local churches. I want you to imagine for a moment that you woke up on a Sunday morning and you're getting your family ready to come to, to church to gather with the body, and, and you look up and there's some clouds in the sky, and those clouds are actually in the shape of letters, and you realize that someone has been skywriting. They hired a biplane with a, with a smoke trail, and they spelled out, Jesus is God? Question mark. Smedley Yates, Grace Bible Church. No, period. Could you imagine if you walked out and you saw heresy skywritten with somebody's name attached to it that you know that is in your church and what they just wrote in the sky disagrees with your doctrinal statement, disagrees with what the church believes and teaches and holds precious and dear. Could you imagine it? Well, it costs a lot of money to rent a biplane. And it's pretty hard to spell all that stuff, and the wind carries away, and then it's gone. But look, I can do it for free in a split second on the internet, and everybody in my church can see it that fast, and it can be dead wrong and misleading, untrue, harmful, and you can't get it back. The wind doesn't blow it away. Imagine for a moment that somebody just walked in the front doors of Grace Bible Church on a Sunday morning and, and there's the, the crew of, of servant greeters out there giving warm ham shakes or fist bumps or elbows or whatever it is we're doing and, and, and giving out note sheets and welcoming people to the body and asking how things are going and someone else is standing in the lobby and handing out literature. What are you handing out? Oh, uh, informational stuff. Oh, what's it about? Bad doctrine, heresy, soul-destroying ideas. You want one? What would the elders of Grace Bible Church do? What would, the, what would Robert Hornack do? <laughs> Sorry, Robert. What, what would our security team do? What would any of you do? Hey, you, you can't hand that stuff out here. Oh, no, no, First Amendment, free speech, I can say whatever I want. Christian charity, right? We can all just communicate. No, we, 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 we'd, we'd take those error-filled pamphlets and throw them in the trash and we'd have a really gentle, nice conversation with somebody who needed to think differently about that. We couldn't do that. What, what about an open mic for a pulpit? And anybody can just say whatever they want because, you know, ideas, information, it's all the same. But it has become so normal to post on Facebook, 
to write a book, record an album. Let me just give you a, a little bit of insight into the Christian book world for a moment. Books come out all the time, and they make bestseller lists. You're probably aware of the state of evangelicalism broadly. The, the church is not in good shape. The church is not holding fast to the truth and boldly proclaiming God's word clearly. Uh, the church is doing a lot of other things, has gotten really distracted and run to error of every sort. And if the evangelical world is as mixed up and backwards as it is, what should we expect from the evangelical publishing world? And every, every time a new book comes out and everybody's buying it, we're tempted to think, oh, I need to get that too. I need to read that. Everybody's reading it. The fact that everybody's reading it should be your first warning. Our church, speaking broadly about evangelicalism in America in the 21st century, is not healthy. And we shouldn't expect that, that the entire evangelical swath of people running towards every latest fad have got their radar up for what is true, what is good, what is helpful, what will stand the test of time and what pleases the Lord. And yet we're in the information age and information just keeps coming. My suggestion to you about books, um, give them a shelf life. <laughs> if a book's been around 20 years, stands the test of 20 years, which is not a long time, and is still valuable, ah, maybe pick it up. You can buy a used copy for 99 cents. It's more economical anyway. And the old adage is helpful. If it's true, it's not new, and if it's new, it's not true. Just remember that. And new ideas are being peddled all the time. What does James say? Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. Why? Because you will incur a stricter judgment. Listen, you set yourself up as a teacher of theological things. In whatever medium, you will be held to stricter account by the Lord of truth. All right, here's the third principle. Speak truth. When you speak, speak truth. Uh, that was very clear from many of the Proverbs we just read. A fourth principle, avoid quarrels. Avoids quarrels. Paul said the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome. The Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome. Listen, there are enemies who fight against the truth. There is a way to contend for truth without being contentious in disposition, attitude, reputation. This does not mean give up the fight for truth, but it means in your personality and your disposition, do not be quarrelsome. If you've ever read a comment thread from a, a YouTube video or a post, you recognize that those comment threads go on and on and on and on and on ad infinitum. And the most vile things get said and posted in comment threads. At some point, you have to say, is anybody listening to this comment thread? Does anybody have the time to thoughtfully engage with the response to the comment to the response to the response that I'm about to put? <laughs> is this the best use of truth in communication? Is this the best forum? Often, it becomes a place to simply vent anger. <laughs> To, to throw in anything you want to say, to be a contrarian, to be contentious. A fifth principle, abstain from self-absorption. This is really one of the great plagues of social media. We are self-absorbed by nature. Right? And there's nothing new in that. Since the fall of man in Genesis 3, we've all been self-absorbed. We're all bad astronomers. We think about the universe and we think about our, the, the place of, of the earth in the Milky Way galaxy, and you think about the, uh, I'm sorry, place of the earth in our solar system, and you think about our solar system in the place of the Milky Way galaxy, and the Milky Way galaxy amongst hundreds of billions of other galaxies in the known universe. And all of that equates to, I am the center of the universe. That's our nature. We were born that way, 
We got that from our parents, and they got it from their parents, all the way back to Adam. Since the fall, we have been self-absorbed. The information age has given new avenues for self-absorption to flourish and to no longer be shameful. It used to be that if you had one person in, in a crowded room that stood up and said, no, I am the center of the universe, all eyes on me, that would be shameful. And now it's almost strange if everybody in the room doesn't do that at the same time. We've just given full license to a self-absorbed expression that is celebrated. This is, a, this is a tragedy. And as believers in Jesus Christ, having been awakened to real astronomy, <laughs> we're not the center of the universe, either by zip code nor theologically. To God be the glory, for from him and through him and to him are all things. That is our new perspective. That is the Christian perspective. And loving others and esteeming others as better than ourselves is the new Christian ethic. And yet on social media, self-absorption is a plague. We want to be seen. We want to be admired. We want to be followed. We want to be liked. And what happens if something that you really thought would be a home run statement on a social media post wasn't liked? Maybe nobody noticed it, or maybe you got a thumbs down. What does that do at the heart level? I think it exposes our idols of wanting to be adored, admired, followed, frankly, worshiped. I recognize that social media has become the new way to let our family and friends keep up with our activities, to see pictures of the grandkids, to see vacation photos. You know, I, you don't meet anybody anymore that pulls out their wallet that's that thick and it has the fold over plastic envelopes with all the pictures of the grandkids and they go, boom, 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 boom. see my grandkids. There's nothing wrong with wanting people to see pictures of your grandkids. And social media has become a new way to do that. It's a much better way than a really thick wallet and fold out envelopes of faded photos. I, I recognize there are some really good uses for that. It certainly beats the, um, the old days of setting up the projector screen and the carousel tray with 48 Kodachrome slides. And you served a nice meal to your friends, and then you said, hey, let's have uh, coffee and dessert, and come on into the living room. I'm going to uh, give you a slideshow of our summer road trip where we saw the world's largest ball of yarn. <laughs> Facebook is way better than that. The pictures are better. The experiences are better. We're much more sophisticated. It's more engaging, more ent entertaining. But today, anyone can paint a picture of his life that others will envy. It doesn't matter what your life is really like. You can paint a picture on the internet that makes everyone envy. It's an avatar. It's a projection of self according to your own desires. It's what you want others to see of you. It's what you want others to esteem about your life and your existence. In some ways, it's a fraud, but it is a fraud that produces a vicious cycle of mutual envy. Have you experienced this? Oh, look at all those things that person gets to do. They never had a bad day, only good vibes. Over and over and over again, you see these remarkable pictures of these wonderful lives of people living just exquisite existences celebrity status, we are their paparazzi, and then they've killed themselves. There's a phoniness to all of it, that, that if we're not careful, we move out of the realm of, I, I, want, I want my mom in Texas to be able to see the pictures of their you know, daughters playing volleyball, into, I want the world to have an estimation of my life that's different than reality because I want them to envy me, because in reality, I envy what everybody else is doing. So this phenomenon, this vehicle, has created the greatest crisis of discontent I think the world has ever known. 
because all of a sudden you're exposed to all the possibilities. You're exposed to everything that's available everywhere and the experiences that everybody else is doing. And it creates this desire in our heart to check off those same boxes, have those same experiences, and then boast in them. Number six is related. Recognize self-exaltation. And implied in the recognition of it is to put it away. But self-exaltation is hard to see. It's sometimes easy to pick out in someone else, but we need to learn to see it in our own motives. The desire to want people to think highly of me, to be impressed with what I know or what I have or what I've done. I, I want to be an influencer. We need to turn from these things. I remember the two weeks that I had a Twitter account And I tweeted a couple of things. And I remember somebody retweeted one of my tweets but misspelled the tweet and I was offended. I was like, oh great, he's got a lot more followers and now they're gonna think I don't know how to spell. <laughs> I remember getting on Twitter two weeks in a row and just seeing, oh, who listened to the sermon? What did they think about it? <laughs> Confession time. <laughs> My heart did not do well with Twitter. It had to go away. And I am so thankful for people who tweet well. I'll just drop a name right here. Richard Caldwell is a good follow. But I can't tweet. I can't have a Twitter account. I, I have experienced what goes on in my heart in a desire to be recognized, to have positive affirmations. My heart can't take that. Principle number seven, refuse gossip and slander. We just heard a bunch of Proverbs. What do the whisperings do? Separate intimate friends. What does the gossip do? Destroy relationships. Um, why do we like gossip? I don't know. It's like a dainty morsel goes down to the innermost being. We love it. We want to be the first to know something and to be able to tell others, yeah, I heard that before you. We want to be the spreader of information. There is an innate attraction in it, and it is destructive. And we must refuse it. Principle number eight for online communications, we must pursue edification. Edification, that is the building up of others. This comes from the principle of love God and love others. That's what we must do. If I'm going to communicate, let my speech be seasoned with grace as with salt. Let it always be for the purpose of benefit. Specifically, benefit towards Christ-likeness. Sometimes that's a rebuke. Sometimes that is a, a loving correction, admonition. Sometimes it is giving counsel. But it must always have as its aim the building up towards Christ-likeness of others. We must refuse to put stumbling blocks in front of people by what we say. Principle number nine, time spent. Uh, be a steward of your time. I won't say any more about that. Number 10, we must speak and broadcast as if we are accountable for every word we type. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this reminder of what you expect when we exercise the tongue. What a remarkable gift you have given to your image bearers in communication. That we can converse, that we can hear from you in your written word, that we can go to you in prayer and that you hear us and you answer. That we can speak with one another. And words have such creative power. They have the ability to move when you came to the earth, you took on the designation, the Word. The Word became flesh. Words are so powerful. Lord, help us to grapple with the gravity, the reality that words misused, mistimed, untrue, harmful, can bring about great devastation. Protect us from these things. Help us to think about our online communications, 
other forms of broadcasting our ideas under the governance of your word. May these texts we look at this morning, may these principles we thought through together, may they govern our lives for your glory. We pray that people would hear words from us, good words, apt words, timely words, like apples of gold and settings of silver, to promote eternal life and Christ's likeness for the benefit of your people and ultimately for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.